and, and I hope that uh, some of that was uh, because of the paths that were laid down by people like Chattopadhyay, Anantakrishnan, Rangabhashyam, foremost among them. And then the juniors among us, like but myself, H. Ramesh, Surendran, Chatramon, Ratnasami, Radha Krishna. Radha Krishna's commitment to GI surgery is probably uh, more than anybody else's. He did an MCH and then he went to all in the institute and told Nandi that uh, I have not learned much surgery, I want to learn surgery. And he spent three years doing a senior registrarship to learn the art and craft of GI surgery. I think that commitment is lacking in some of the new generation that I see. They want to come in on day one and uh, uh, they want within a few weeks to do a ripper, to do a liver resection. And, uh, you know, they are unhappy. And uh, I know I am a medical director, so I get a lot of complaints from other departments, uh, PGs. My department PGs, of course, won't approach me, but they come from other departments. And they complain that they're not getting chances. So I said, you joined six months ago. Why are you talking of chances? This is a time to just understand the protocols, understand the instruments, understand the patients. When to do, what to do is very important rather than how to do. Once you learn that, you learn how to do. But they are so impatient. And uh, I really pity them because uh, Patta knows that uh, I did a two-year MCH at, All Indians, at uh, Madras Medical College before him. And during two years, I did one GJ. That's all I did. That too, after Dr. Rangabhashim had done the gastrectomy, he left the GJ to me and went. And uh, in the emergencies, of course, we were free to do, but I felt so sorry for the MS postgraduates who were also posted in Argonaut. In those days, it was a MS come MCH unit that I used to allow them to do all the emergencies, uh, right hemi, colectomies, uh, section anastomosis, perforation, perforation, Everything I used to allow them to do, I used to assist them. And the benefit that I got was that I sat in my chair in Ward 10 and I would just tell them, hey, get me the blood sample reports of those 10 patients and everything and they'll get everything. And poor Ratnasami, who was one year senior to me, would be running around up and down trying to get the results because no PG will do it for him. Because Ratnasami will do even a hydro seed and not give it to the PG. One day he saw me sitting. He said, have you got all the results? I said, yeah, that's, I got all the results. Here they are. He said, how did you get the results? I never saw you move from your chair. I said, sometimes, you know, results fly in through the air and they come to me. Uh, you know, then I told him, uh, my PGs bring it. He said, my PGs never bring it. They just disappear. I said, you treat them like uh, servants, uh, hold them, make them hold retract, and that's all. So that's what you will get. You give them chances and then you will see what difference they will do to your work. And, uh, and that has been my sort of uh, in the Brahmastra in surgery, giving chances to the juniors because once you give them chances, they will do work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Um, we are very honored and happy to have you on uh, Let's Learn uh, Surgery. Communication is one of the skills that is uh, not uh, taught to medical students or even postgraduates in a formal manner. And uh, as has been well documented, almost all the uh, medical legal cases and probably even violence against doctors is related to poor communication. So uh, we are very happy to have you today to talk to us about how to communicate with uh, difficult patients. So uh, it may not be politically correct to use that word, but at uh, learning general surgery, as you know, and uh, Pata Radhagrishna, we call a spade a spade. So we went ahead and used that uh, word difficult. 
I uh, request Ilango Sethu to in, uh, introduce Dr. Ramesh Ardhanadi, though he doesn't need introduction to LGS members. Over to you, Ilango. Dr. Ramesh Ardhanadi uh, actually no, needs no introduction right across the globe. Um, but uh, to make things complete, I'm, I'm, I'm just stating down what I have learned about him over the years, hearing stories about him uh, from his PG days. So he's an alumnus of CMC um, Velour, where he did his MBBS and then went on to do his MS in uh, Olney Institute of Medical Sciences. And he was one of uh, the first few batches of MCH uh, graduates from the Madras Medical College under uh, Professor Rangabhashyam. I mean, not a day goes through when uh, uh, Dr. Surendran tells another story of what he did during his MCH days and what happened after that, <laughs> including his coffee uh, and stuff like that. So I really know a lot I can share here, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Adhanari continues to be the live wire of many of the GI surgical meetings and general surgical meetings and laparoscopy meetings that are conducted in India. And uh, he's a go-to resource under uh, for several topics. Uh, we have listened to him as students and then as consultants. And um, uh, we are so happy to host him here in uh, Let's Learn Surgery on a topic which is really difficult to handle. Uh, welcome to LLS Group, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. G.D. Sharma to learning general surgery is uh, like, uh, you know, uh, talk, talk, introducing Dr. Bhishma to the rest of the members of Mahabharata. Uh, and uh, it's privileged to have you, sir. And uh, the conversation with you is not just difficult patients, difficult students, uh, difficult colleagues, uh, difficult management, and so on. So we have uh, two very senior persons in the field of surgery conversing with each other as to how they deal with these situations. Over to uh, Dr. Giriyal Sharma. Good evening, uh, Dr. Ramesh. We welcome you to LGS platform. And uh, today we would like to discuss and share some of the common, common situations. Some common situations faced on day-to-day -day basis, and we would like to learn from your great experience. How how do we handle? And if there are some questions from the floor, uh, we would like to clarify, either of us or jointly. So the difficult situations, you know, any success story in life is outside the comfort zone of a surgeon. So there are difficult patients, there are difficult attendants and difficult colleagues on both ends of the spectrum, a difficult boss and a difficult junior, a tough administrator and at times a tough resident as they are getting more and more vocal and powerful by national board. So we will start this evening uh, Dr. Ramesh, uh, how we will start with a difficult attendant and a patient. How, how about a patient who is as calling you again and again, asking about uh, the son calls from Houston, the daughter calls from Chennai about their welfare of their father who has carcinoma of the colon and is obstructed, has been operated. Each one of us experience some nagging people, which is the least of the difficulty when they call up again and again and are time consuming. How would you manage such a situation? Yeah, this is a, a very common uh, situation. And uh, especially now that uh, in the present middle class, you will find that uh, all of them have one or two um, children who are in the States and some relatives who are doctors and some of them are surgeons and uh, they will be they will not be directly related but there will be pressure on them to ask them what is going on so when i get a call from one of these people uh, i tell them sir 
you should first understand that I am bound by patient confidentiality. Just like you are bound by patient confidentiality under the HIPAA rules in uh, USA, we also have certain conference. So there are certain things which I cannot tell you. I can tell you overall how the patient is doing, but there are not certain uh, things which are there. Then some of them will say, you know, India, they are not strict, so you can tell it. I tell them it's not true. If somebody were to record this conversation and play it in a court, I might be held guilty of uh, uh, revealing the patient's secrets. Therefore, I, it, it's a useful uh, tool when the patient sounds uh, aggressive, when they are uh, looking a little, uh, you know, tense on the thing. And uh, the American, at least, and the British, they have this strict confidential, so they understand. So this is one weapon that is there, and you can uh, utilize this weapon uh, when you need it to tell them this. Uh, the second thing is, of course, that the patient is genuinely sick, and they are worried. So if it's a son or a daughter uh, speaking to me, I tell them, uh, sir, I would advise you to get on the earliest flight and come here because I don't think your father or your mother is going to pull through the next 24 to 48 hours. When the situation is grim, I usually give them the news straight because that is sometimes the best way to convey a blunt message. You get on the flight and come here. I don't think that your father is going to live for 24 or 48 hours and you may like to see him and have a last few words uh, otherwise, you will regret it for the rest of your life. So that is one other way I uh, utilize it. The third is that uh, all American surgeons think that uh, Indian surgeons are incompetent. And uh, that our level of training is uh, low compared to their level of uh, uh, training. So, uh, I think that's a very unfair uh, thing. There are many Indian surgeons who are far superior to some of the best surgeons that you will find in the United States. And uh, you all know examples of them who are there all over the country. Palni Velu, my good friend, is one of those examples. So when they question my competence, and they will do it delicately. Sir, uh, I had a pediatric surgeon ringing about his uh, 10 year old nephew who had a cholecystitis required a acute cholecystitis required a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and he started asking me sir what are your conversion rates what are your uh, uh, bile duct injury rates so i told him on the phone very bluntly sir let me tell you one thing if i have to convert this patient there is no surgeon in the world, including the United States, who will not convert this patient. I told him that over 12,000 cholecystectomies, I have not converted a single patient. And that includes every level, gangrenous cholecystitis, perforated cholecystitis, cholecystoduodenal fistula. I have never converted. And nor have I ever injured the CBD by not converting. So I told him this very bluntly. I don't know whether he believed me or not, but these are two figures. These are the figures that I have. And uh, he then he cut the line and then he said, okay. And the parents said, you can go ahead. I did it. And the next day the patient was discharged. There was no problem. But this is what you will find, uh, as you say, when you get calls from abroad. Uh, be polite. Don't be arrogant. So, so I never used an arrogant tone. I used a very polite tone. And I told him uh, what I, I can do and uh, what I am uh, capable of doing. And uh, I told him also that uh, the equipment that I have, I told him that what I have, and uh, that sort of stunned him because he didn't expect a hospital in Madurai to have uh, the equipment that we had to perform a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And uh, he was surprised, but he uh, later rang me up and said, thank you very much for the thing. So, so, so it has to be, Handled with care, you know, you know, they are worried, they are talking and, uh, you know, Indian patients, you know, they will go to 20 people and try to put pressure on you, thinking as if putting pressure on you gives better, better results, which is not necessarily uh, true.
this that, that's nice that's that's regarding an educated guy calling from uh, abroad yeah now there must be some local people in and around from the villages when when their anastomosis leaks unexpectedly and the patient needs a stoma and a resurgery again patient is shifted from ward to icu and uh, is on uh, a non invasive ventilation and uh, obviously here the scene is different uh, here you are now a little bit on the back foot yes yes you know you, you, you so, know that you are on the back foot so it, so, so so the yeah. fir- so in my department we have a very low threshold for performing ostomies at the very first go because we rather would manage an ostomy than manage a leak and uh, we with you, sir. Your, yours is a specialized department yeah what would you advise a regular journal surgeon same who he when his such a situation comes with him you can uh, anticipate who will leak so yeah. you will do a stoma first so But so you you don't have a competence like you he, he will look at the case he will see the bad bubble he will see the edematous bubble he will see that where it touches it bleeds uh the bubble is thick friable uh, this is not a bu- uh, and when you have generalized peritonitis abscess in the cavity uh, you should know from physiology that the peritonitis and inflammation in the peritoneal cavity inhibits wound healing and therefore leads to more uh, fistula formation and therefore we should uh, be prepared to do an ostomy now why do people uh, i mean i hear this uh, talk you know our patients don't accept ostomy it is not our patients don't accept ostomy it is our surgeons. surgeons who don't accept ostomy they think it's a defeat of surgery to do an ostomy and uh, their body language when they talk to the patient is not confident enough to say i need to do an ostomy in our department when we say ostomy the body language speaks as an ostomy and we tell them if you opt not for an ostomy the patient leaks and if he dies you are responsible i am not responsible because i am going to write here that you refused an ostomy in the first place i tell them very clearly this is been now ingrained in our patient and so in my hospital there is virtually uh less than a 1% refusal of ostomy they all agree and then we reconstruct them after 3 months and they do well and uh, no patient uh, uh, so so all our pgs when they come uh, some of them are trained in centers where they don't do ostomies and then they come and within 3 months these people are the most aggressive ostomy uh, because they are now seeing the results of different that they used to do it there it used to leak then the patient used to die We do an ostomy the patient recovers goes home comes back for a closure and is all right and so they become very aggressive ostomies and sometimes i wonder whether uh, they do a couple of unnecessary ostomies but i never criticize them for that because i would rather that they do ostomies than not do ostomies agreed sir that we all agree. that is somewhere lack of proper training to a general surgeon yes on this issue but today's today's issue is what will you advise if such a thing has happened now there is a ah, okay crowd. now the next question today so 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 we have not done an ostomy we are now in the situation of that there is a leak so the the the, the thing to tell the patient and i tell them up front look we put some stitches his body didn't heal the stitches they have given way now if i leave it like this he is going to die so i have to open him up i have to wash out all the dirt and i have to bring the end as a ostomy if i don't now if i try to anastomose it will not heal so i will do an uh, ostomy and come out and the patient will recover and uh, then we will take care of him uh, uh, these patients sometimes have a stomy post op period so they have this uh, uh, ventilation for one or two days so the charges go up and i tell them that uh, i will talk to the administration and i will reduce the charges as far as possible and i'll try to give you a reasonable bill uh, you brought him in an emergency so we cannot always predict the bill but i will not i'll make sure that uh, you have uh, sufficient resources to uh, pay for this so so the question is now that the, the time it has leaked uh, i have seen surgeons go in and then they try try to close that uh, leak in two layers 
and then they phone me and say we close it in two layers it's still leak uh, you can close it in 20 layers it will still leak once it has leaked that is a infected area there is a lot of inflammation and that will never heal you have to bring it out this lesson it has to be driven if you drive this lesson uh, surgeons will get uh, good results and a good name the problem comes that when you do an ostomy and the patient recovers and he visits a second surgeon for an opinion, the second surgeon says, this was an unnecessary procedure. Our surgeons betray our own colleagues. Uh, I, I think uh, I will tell you a fact of life that I have now removed 12 pads from patients' abdomens. Two of the patients knew before they came that there was a pad. One was a patient from Surat, and India, a South Indian settled there. And he told me that while they were operating, the power went off, everything went off. And so they closed and then the doctor said, there may be a pad left behind, I want to re-explore. said, no, I'll go to South and get it explored. He came straight to us. We explored, removed the pad, did everything. That was a cesarean section. The child is well and the patient was also well. The second case, and this is a real misfortune. There was a gynecologist who did a vaginal hysterectomy and left a pad in the uh, abdomen. Uh, and this patient was having a stinky discharge from the vagina, went to another gynecologist, found the pad, and immediately said there's a pad inside and made a big hue and cry. And they sued the first gynecologist and then I removed the pad and settled everything and sent the patient off. Two years later, the second gynecologist left a pad inside. And this patient went to the first gynecologist and he said, they have left a pad inside and everything. So, you know, both got sued and both are sitting. So, so what I have done in the other 10 cases is that I have never let the patient know that there's a pad inside. Uh, though the CT report, they may sometimes give it as gossip by your and all. I call the CT people and tell them to change the report and say, uh, pus seen or something seen so that the doctor escapes. And what I do is that uh, I have a technique for doing that. I open the abdomen alone. I tell the PGs to stay out. I will tell them I'll call them. And I have my senior most sister assisting me. And I open the abdomen and I put in about 15 pads soaked. And then I remove all the pads one by one. And, and in that process, I remove the uh, pad that was left behind. And then I tell the sister there will be a count of an extra pad. You tell everybody to ignore that and write it as normal and that's it. what happened. And in the end, the patient does well, he recovers, and nobody is the wiser. Uh, I mean, uh, some people may say that I was wrong, that I should not protect uh, surgeons who do wrong. I don't think, I, I do wrong so many times. I made mistakes. So I don't think that we should uh, ever point a finger at a colleague of ours, especially in tough times like this. It is so pleasing to learn, Dr. Ramesh. We, we are trained in quite different situations. You are a specialist, I am a journalist, but we think so alike. I, I will add on to it. I also remove the sponges like this and my number may be similar, but then in the evening, I call the gynecologist. Yeah, that I, I do. No, then I start like this, that uh, Dr. Mrs. Gupta, in my life, I have more complications than you could have ever imagined because I do more number of cases and I do more sick number of cases. But on a given this patient, we have done like this. Do you want me to return your sponge or should I discard? And, and I also uh, tell the surgeons after a couple of days, I phone them up. And when I phone one of them up, he was very aggressive towards me and started shouting. Have you never made any mistakes? You have never. And I told him, look, we are not here to discuss this. I just wanted to tell you this so that you can ramp up the conditions where you count your pad, warn your sisters, so it doesn't happen again. If I had wanted to, I could have told the patient and they would have, if I, I have not wanted to do that, that's why I'm telling you in a private call. Then he cooled down and he understood why he did. He's now become a very good friend of mine. So, so I think that uh, these are the things that uh, can, you know, spoil patient-doctor relationships and we have to avoid somehow to do that. Sir, how about uh, having a sudden pulmonary embolism and a ar arrest in the ward, unexpected, 
in a moderate risk patient. I'm sure all high risk patient we want, all high risk patients, we also give them anticoagulation. But how about when it happens suddenly, following uh, an elective uh, uh, surgery? This is, this is a very difficult situation to handle. You know, uh, patient is, uh, and uh, I have had uh, a patient, uh, the chairman of the Tutukuran Port Trust wife, she was admitted for, uh, I didn't know this history, she was admitted for five days in uh, Tutukuran and then she was transferred to us with a blocked umbilical hernia. I operated on her and uh, set things right. And uh, the next day, I was on rounds and uh, she was the first patient on the first bed and I saw her in the post-op ward. She said she's comfortable. She just had some uh, thing to drink. We had moved four beds and suddenly uh, she collapsed and the nurse had run to ring the code blue and I went to her and she was not breathing and we did massage and everything. And we got the cardiologist immediately to come and everything and she had had a massive uh, pulmonary embolism. But because it was early, we, we got the tube in, we got some oxygenation in and our radiologist came, took her to the cath lab, he passed the catheters, he sucked all the clots, then he put urokinase or whatever it is into the uh, arterial pace or whatever it is into the uh, pulmonary artery, opened it out and uh, she, uh, within 24 hours she was perfectly normal, she was breathing 100% on room air and she is doing well today. So once in a while these things can be salvaged. But by and large, they are not salvaged and they die. And when they die, it is uh, very, very difficult. And uh, many times we get sued. And uh, I have had a patient whom I did an anterior resection. Uh, the patient was on the sixth day. His right tube had been removed. He was, uh, his son was the commissioner of police in uh, Chennai. And uh, the patient uh, arrested because of... Uh, aspiration, we thought aspiration, he arrested and uh, his son came and uh, they made a big noise because somebody was trying to do cardiac massage. They misunderstood him. They said they killed him by sitting on his chest. That's what the relative, the uneducated relative told the uh, commissioner that they sat on his chest and they killed him. And so he got very angry and then he has filed the case against us. Uh, in the court, but luckily I insisted that we should do a postmortem. You are uh, accusing me of killing him. We should do a postmortem, and we did a postmortem. And when we did a postmortem, very clearly the postmortem surgeon showed that uh, he had had an acute myocardial infarction. That his uh, left main coronary was blocked. He showed the clot. Photographs were taken, and so it is still in court. But the the evidence is in our favor. And it is, it is very clear that he is not interested in pursuing because the last 15 uh, appearances he has not shown up. So, uh, so this is another lesson we have learned over the years. When a patient suddenly dies, when a patient dies because you also don't know why, insist on a postmortem. Now, if uh, most of the patients will not want a postmortem. And so if they don't want a postmortem, you write there and get them to sign that we don't want a postmortem. Now this becomes a very big protection to you in the legal law because you yourself have said that I don't know what the cause and I want a postmortem. They have refused. So the onus has gone on to them and uh, that uh, makes, uh, so always uh, suggest a postmortem and get it written that they don't want it or if they want it, get a postmortem and you'll often have answers which you otherwise didn't have. Sir, as you said in the beginning of uh, your lecture discussion, that the current generation wants to do all the big jobs early in their career. They want to go popular and rich overnight, have a D-segment car and a beautiful bungalow. And uh, there must be, you know, situations when the junior faculty keeps scribbing that this guy doesn't allow us to cut at all. He comes, find faults and goes away. He, our salary is the same. I had only a very meager rise. You know, some gossipers are there everywhere. Which torpedo the reputation of the unit. Yeah. 
Uh, how, how, how would you advise managing such people? Well, I have been now the medical director of Meenakshi Mission Hospital for eight years. So I'm very much aware of uh, this because I get complaints from postgraduates and uh, trainees from other departments who come to me and uh, complain that they're not being given chances. Now, <clears throat> their problem also lies that they compare with the other departments and the departments are operating next doors to each other. So they come and they see in my operation theater, the final year uh, DNB postgraduate is doing in Whipple independently, skin to skin, you know, and no, no consultant is uh, scrubbed. We just come one by one and look up over his shoulder to make sure things are going all right. They do Whipple, they do D2 gastrectomies, uh, they do colonic resections, they do independently all these operations in their final year. So the other departments, uh, they get very upset and they come and ask me, your department, you give so much chances. Why can't you make our consultants give us chances? This is something that I cannot do. And you know that it cannot. And this happens even in major medical colleges. In a center like All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the Department of General Surgery was very generous. They would get a lot of chances. But if you go to urology department, virtually none of the residents would do. Only the consultants would operate. And uh, in many other departments, it was similar like that. Whereas in some departments, there were uh, very generous consultants who used to allow the PGs to do a lot. So even when it can happen at the top medical institutions, and I told you, I spent two years doing MCH and I did one GG. Now, it would have been very easy for me to take out that frustration on my PGs and do it. But I have always been, even as a senior registrar in All India Institute, I used to give uh, my postgraduates a lot of chances, even on cases which I have not done. I used to assist them. To me, assisting somebody on a case, junior, even if I have not done it, is as good as me doing it. That has been my approach. And uh, I have always taught them. And when I teach them, they develop respect for you. They learn and they always respect it. And uh, I've had some very distinguished uh, students whom I have given uh, all my chances and they have learned a lot of surgery. Uh, you know, you, some of these are nationally renowned uh, uh, names like Subhash Gupta, like Arvindar Singh Soy. And all, they were all my uh, interns and PGs. As interns, I made them do GJ vagotomies, rectal prolapse repairs, I taught them. So they were, uh, they handled the needle. They had, the first time I taught them how to handle the needle and needle order in the uh, village in the primary health center. So, so I've always been one who has been generous because I was given a lot of chances because I had a senior, Vinay Kapoor, who was very generous in giving his chances. So, you know, you have a senior, you tend to give chances. Uh, but the main reason why I think consultants don't want to give the juniors chances is insecurity. And uh, I have had uh, consultants who have come to me and said, don't hire this man as a junior consultant because he is from Madurai. After three years, he will leave us and he will go start his private practice and be a competition to us. Uh, somehow I used to feel ridiculous, but then I we give the independence to the uh, head of department to select this consultant. So we allow them to select it. But uh, this is the sort of fear the consultants fear, that these people will take away their... Uh, income their chances and uh, i've been warned by many people you're teaching all these people they will one day displace you i said see one day i am going to be displaced if not by them then by nature you know none of us are going to live forever there will be a time when i can no longer operate and i will leave and so if i can leave behind a legacy of students and the students respect me for having taught them everything that i know that is all that i want So your question whether we can uh, correct these people, this is very difficult unless we bring in a systemized uh, auditing like the American style, where they will come and audit every year and the candidate has to perform. The, what they do is that if the candidate doesn't do that, he's not given the chances, they disrecognize the university, the college. And that means that, and uh, you know that residencies are funded by the Federal government. So, yes, yeah. so if they if you if they de-recognize you, you will lose the whole workforce, and now you have to hire paying from your pocket. 
So, yes. so, so in the United States, because of this, almost all cases are done only by postgraduates in the institutes, unless it's in a private practice setup. So the postgraduates do a lot of surgery, and the attendings only stand there and look at the operation and make sure nothing is going wrong. So, so unless we can bring in an audited system, which I don't think we can bring in, because uh, that would be very difficult and uh, uh, that would be not uh, possible. And unfortunately, well, and unfortunately, Dr. Girija, the government of India in its short-sightedness uh, has suddenly for no reason increased enormously the number of postgraduate seats. Now, yeah. you can increase undergraduate seats, it doesn't matter, they can read, they can this thing. But postgraduate seats means training you have to give. For example, just to take, 10 years ago, Tata Memorial Hospital used to take two MCH candidates a year. Today, they take 23 MCH candidates a year, which means that at the end of three years, they have 69 MCH candidates rotating in Tata Memorial Hospital. Like, can you teach 69 people the <laughs> ins and outs of surgical oncology? And no way. Two brilliant. The, that's why the earlier batch who were trained the, the, from the two, all the surgeons were outstanding when they came. They were well trained. They, they could cut and they could sit, stitch beautifully. They knew all the steps. Now they come, they are not at all confident of what they are doing and I've seen that. And uh, similarly, in many the centers, they have increased the seats. In uh, Madras Medical College now, they take, I think, 24 MC, uh, MS seats a year, 72 at a time. Uh, how can you teach them? You have one admission day a week and uh, two theaters or three theaters. How can you teach 72 students out of which 10 are in your unit? It, you just can't teach them. So I think this is also a mistake that we have made without thinking of the consequences on training. Right. Uh, sir, what is your advice to a youngster who is stuck with a bad boss, a nasty boss who just finds faults, doesn't allow cutting? Uh, I mean, should he confront the boss? Should he no. leave the boss? No, he, he should leave. Back? No, he should leave. He should resign and he should leave. And uh, when he leaves, he should uh, boldly put, uh, put a message in Facebook or in others that I am leaving because of the following reasons. And uh, you can rest assured that uh, that uh, nobody else will come and join that boss for a junior position uh, in the near. Uh, as a matter of fact, these people have a very active circle in which they really discuss these things. And before they choose their postgraduate institute for training in various subjects, they actually have a long discussion in these groups and then they discuss uh, uh, which groups to go. And you will notice that there is a very strong correlation. If you take GI surgery in DNB, the first choice is the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. They have high volume of work and both Pradeep Prabella and G.V. Rao give the chances to everybody, uh, all of them, all the consultants, they give the chances to the juniors, so they do a lot of surgery. So they get a good training, so they all uh, opt for that. Uh, and you'll be surprised that for the last three years, after the uh, these two in the DNB selection, the Meenakshi Mission Hospital has been the number two choice for uh, thing. The reason being that we also give a lot of choice, choice chances, but more than that, we have a, a holistic training. We have emergencies, uh, we have uh, elective surgery. We also have laparoscopic surgery, advanced laparoscopic surgery, and we also have uh, a training in endoscopy for postgraduates. So all postgraduates are posted for doing, and by the time they leave, they can do an upper GI and a colonoscopy confidently. So because of that, we get a lot of uh, students. So they, they do have a discussion board on which they decide these and they come. <laughs> I was worried that we pay them compared to uh, Delhi and Bombay, where uh, the or Delhi, where the pay scales are very high. Uh, DNB pages get 1.2 lakhs and all that. We pay them you know, 55, 60 thousand. So I was worried that because the pay they will go. No, they prefer the training and they choose training over pay because they know that that is more important in three days. And uh, we get uh, high quality candidates. Uh, Can you teach them to fish? 
Yes, we teach we teach them to practice. Uh, yeah. I will say that the difference between my college and an all India institute or a JIPMER is that my PGs are trained to practice in a medium sized hospital in a town. They can handle an appendicitis laparoscopically. They can do a lap hernia. They can do a lap incisional hernia. They can do an emergency perforation closure laparoscopically. They can do whipples. They can do esophagectomies. They can do uh, minimal access colorectal surgery. So they're trained across the board. And I think that uh, is what they want. Right. So now, now you happen to be on the other end of the table. Uh, a very common situation in which a young surgeon, even a middle or higher seniority surgeon has to face is the administrator, medical director, whatever we can uh, you know, call the name. The head of the hospital calls and says, uh, Dr. Agarwal, look, uh, your, this patient has developed a complication. Family is not paying the money. The common issues which a surgeon has to explain to administrator are a bill more than expected, number one, a complication which is unexpected. This happens more in private sector. And the third thing is at times that your revenues for last two months are quite low. You are not generating enough money. So uh, would you like to tell us one by one? Yeah. Uh, That's another source uh, of stress for a young person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am on the medical, I'm the medical director, but I don't look after the, I don't discuss with any doctors the financial implications. Uh, that is done by a medical administrator and by a general manager who look after these things. Uh, fortunately for us, our founder, the man who started this institution is a urologist and uh, he understands and he understood that these things happen and uh, complications happen, patients die. So he would never criticize any of these complications. And he gave us the freedom from day one when I joined in 1990, April, the hospital began. And I joined on day one, and I am the only one remaining 32 years later with the same hospital. But he gave us the power to be every senior consultant and head of department. You can write off bills if you want. I am not bothered about the bottom line of a single patient. I will look after your yearly figures or six monthly figure. So if over a year you generate 10 crores, and you lose 15 lakhs because patients didn't pay their bills. I don't bother. You will still be on the positive, which is what the problem is that the modern administrators are micromanaging. They are not macromanaging. They don't look at the overall picture. So they see one patient is not paying the bill and they are offering you that patient is not paying the bill. That patient. They forget that there are 100 patients who have successfully paid their bills who have gone out and generated a profit. So you, you should be looking at the bigger picture. And unfortunately, these professionals are not trained. They are trained to nitpick. And uh, that is why uh, in our hospital, our chairman always said that the medical director should be a doctor. It should not be a non-medical uh, because they can understand the problems of doctors and they can deal with the problems of uh, doctors. So in our hospital, we don't generally face this question of uh, uh, bill and uh, payment. It does come once in a while. And uh, the commonest department, let me be fair that it comes, is from cardiology. Uh, so these people will take the patient onto the angiogram table. And then they will uh, talk the sweet talk the patient into accepting three stents. And they put three stents. And due to some reason, the patient dies uh, within 24 hours. By the time the patients have not yet paid for the stents, now they tell you, I'm not going to pay for the stents. So, so you say, I will not release the body. Let's keep the body. What will you do? Nothing. So I, tell, so I tell them, accept the loss. They made enormous profits for you from other cases. Accept this and let them go. And tell them that in future, if you put three stents, 
make sure that you can get some money in first, at least for one or two steps before yeah. putting uh, three steps. So we have made those rules and those, see, we learn from our mistakes and we make uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, as you said, the problem comes when you have a well patient walking into the hospital, undergoing a surgical procedure and having a major complication and uh, uh, a life-threatening complication and maybe even uh, death. That is a very difficult situation to manage. manage. And uh, the only thing that we can do is that we can talk to the patients. And I would say that one other thing I would like to tell my surgical friends and everybody is that sometimes these things will happen at 2 o'clock at night or 3 o'clock at night. The patient suddenly is breathless, he's collapsed, there's bleeding in the tube and your PG is giving blood. If you take the small trouble of coming to the hospital at that time, staying with the patient for an hour or two, trying to stabilize the patient, many of the relatives feel so pleased that the senior doctor came, sat with the patient, that they will forgive your mistakes. We often avoid and don't go because we are scared that there's a complication, they will shout at us. No. If you go there, sit with the patient, talk with the relatives, talk with the patient and keep trying to do things, they will actually appreciate it. I've had many such uh, appreciations. And I fully endorse your view. CMC Ludhiana, where I was trained, had this writing on the wall. No patient died, no unpatient died unexpectedly without the presence of unit head. Yes. Be it 2 a.m., be it 4 a.m., if an unexpected patient has worse, you know, worsened suddenly when he was not expected to, you know, go on ventilator or code blue, the unit head has to come. The yes. Bad news is broken after an hour by the unit head and people watch and the families were permitted to watch resuscitation even. Yes. Those sensible people. Then from time to time, he will brief. Now we have done this. We have done this. All the best drugs are being given and still, and then though I am a Brahmin by birth, but I have a lot of uh, embedded Christian philosophy. Then one word, that one word, I may not do it. But when I say, we all pray that your son survives. This one word carries a lot of impact on the family. You're that right. See, you see, what is this? This is communication. Yeah. This is what we began with. You know, you communicate and half the problems will disappear. It's the importance of communication. It is when we don't communicate that a lot of, uh, you know, suspicions of malpractice of fighting and occurs that the doctor is trying to hide something, you know. I, I mean, I openly tell them the complication. I tell them that uh, this artery is here. I showed them a chart. And I say that uh, sometimes there may be a small leak and this artery is now bleeding. I have to block that artery. So I'm going to take the radiologist to take block it. And if he successfully blocks it, I show them that, see, look, it was bleeding here. Now you have blocked it. It is not bleeding. Show them the angiogram. And then, the, you know, you, you, you can really uh, change a patient's point of view of the doctor from uh, being a bad man to being a man who is trying his best. And that... Uh, and so one of the mistake doctors make is that uh, they guarantee things before surgery. Now, even today, I have, uh, as I told you, done more than about 15,000 policies techniques without a single conversion or a bile duct injury. But when the patient sits in front of me and says, can you guarantee that this will be done laparoscopically? I say, no, I cannot guarantee it. I have gone through 15,000 cases without a conversion, but this may be the case that I may have to convert. So I cannot guarantee. If you want a guarantee of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, I cannot do. All I can guarantee is I will do a safe cholecystectomy. I will do it laparoscopically, but if it's not possible, I will convert and I will remove the gallbladder, solve this problem, but I will not guarantee. And therefore, my consent is never for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It is for cholecystectomy. And uh, I always write that the conversion may be needed. And this again, this conversion, uh, the consent is very important. 
that you should have all the proper uh, uh, consents taken, especially for ostomies, for uh, conversions, for major leaks, and tell them that these things happen. I mean, and all of us know that these things happen. And uh, the like, I tell you the difference between a good surgeon and a bad surgeon. The good surgeon has his complications on poor, insignificant patients. The bad surgeon has his complications on the VIPs. There's all the difference. Everybody yes. has complications. But when you have your complications on VIPs, you get a bad name. So when you have your complications on good, uh, you know, poor patients, uh, nobody mind. They are, they say, okay, sir, take it, we will take him. And so they don't uh, create a big scene. Uh, any questions other than this you wanted to address? No. Uh, we, we have the last uh, point left. Uh, uh, the difficulties with the, your fellows and your residents. Here, I would not like prospective within your unit because you permit a lot of surgery, because you look after them. Your scenario may be different. Yeah. In most places, this does not happen. This, this particular today's discussion is not aimed only between your and my unit. Yeah, this is across the board. We have boys and girls here right now on our Facebook page who, who are having a lot of problems. Yeah. So how about how about if to a chief, how will you advise a middle level chief who, whose residence is especially in DNB? Because the boss cannot fail the candidate. The candidate will so, pass. So, so they so, come to me and uh, about other departments, as a medical director, I get these complaints about other departments. I tell them, look, I did MCH for two years and I did one GJ. So don't think that you're in a unique position. I was in the same uh, position uh, long ago. So what you can do is keep your mouth shut. Read well. Pass your exams, get your degree, then identify a place where there's a lot of work, where the chances are being given, go join that. Even if it is at a lower salary than you would expect, they may not pay you one lakh, they may pay you 50,000, doesn't matter. Take that and just bite your teeth and for one, me one year, you do a lot of cases, you, you will gain your uh, surgical confidence and then you, can, you will have your... Uh, uh, demands uh, met and uh, you know this planning in life is very important uh, to me the primacy is to get the degree to get the surgical experience is a secondary effect uh, many people make a mistake and say that they should get the uh, uh, surgical training when they are doing a, in an ideal world yes but it doesn't happen in most places uh, in India so remember that you are not in an isolated boat. It happens in most places in uh, India. In our hospital, we have ten, 10 surgical departments training, out of which only one is satisfactory as far as the residents are concerned. Nine are oh, getting complaints. And I tell them, look, get your degree, get out, go somewhere and learn. And you will learn. Uh, work in a mission hospital. They'll pay you 30,000 rupees a month, give you a house. You work there, but you will do uh, 10 scissors, a week, you will do 100 deliveries a week, you will become at the end of one year fully experienced enough to do gynecology if you are a gynecologist. And if you are a general surgeon, you will do plenty of appendix hernia, uh, laparotomies, and you will become very well uh, uh, ex ex experienced. So I tell them this and I try to teach them this and uh, some of them take it in a good way, but some of them are upset and they keep uh, uh, cribbing, but then those people will crib no matter what you do. So there are some born cribbers, so you can't do much about it. And we have to adjust, but my primacy is always to get the degree. First get the degree, then you can always get the training for a year somewhere, and then you can uh, move on. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of discussion. And uh, I would uh, love any questions from the floor, uh, Dr. Lingo. Dr. Pata, would you like to share your ideas? Sir, uh, I mean, uh, it's not a sharing idea because, you know, uh, I've seen issues where, uh, you know, uh, somebody 
he joins you as a, one of your assistants or a junior colleague and then uh, a year later <clears throat> you know want to be a lot more progressive as was discussed earlier uh, and you have the power to you know allow that person or send him home how do you deal with a person like that because these days as you rightly put it sir that uh, you know people want to yeah so so this is very important see if you are working in a place where you are only a consultant and you are bother about earning money not bother about developing the department of this thing then you just do your case and you forget about everybody else and do your own patients and get lost earn your money and go but i work in a department where i want the department to grow and i want the department so what i did uh, about 5 6 years ago was that i brought my I, we have four consultants i brought them all and sat them and i told them that uh, look everybody does everything nobody is going to become an expert at uh, different uh, things and we need experts so i identified one of them and said look you do all the hepatic resections and hepatic surgery from now on apart from your routine work but we so so um, uh, the two senior of us uh, we started referring all our resections to him so in the last year 3 uh, years i haven't done a single hepatic resection i no longer do that i uh, refer it to him and what has happened is that he has now done uh, every year we used to do about 15 to 20 resections a year now that would be distributed between four consultant he is doing 3 4 now he has uh, managed <coughs> to do about 30 resections in the last uh, Uh, three four years, and you can see the confidence he has gained. He has now started doing it, laparoscopic mobilization, and I'm sure he'll soon do laparoscopic uh, hepatic resection. He has done one case already, so his confidence level has boosted. So that another consultant I called and said, "Look, all our department bariatric surgery we are sending to you. You become a bariatric surgeon. You look after that." So so we didn't have much of a load of bariatric surgery. each one you should do one case or two days a year now he is doing and he is getting more cases and now with the carpathitum coming in we are hoping he will his uh, bariatrics will pick up and he will uh, look after that and uh, we share the income this is basically the problem comes because the people feel that if somebody does the money goes uh, we still share the income between all this so all of us get uh, a percentage of the income depending on your seniority and years of uh, working so i stick to laparoscopy and to pancreas and to colorectal uh, so so each of us has uh, taken a core area of, of our interest and we have uh, trying to improve in that core area and do more and in a few years i will probably start slowing down and i'll pass on this to uh, some of them I'll, i'll i'll i will bifurcate it into couple of things of colorectal uh, and pancreas into two things and send it to them and say you take care of it so i think this is very important that you have to encourage the growth of your juniors also if you see money is important but uh, many people would also like to have growth and uh, that we should encourage as chief and only if you do that you will be able to build a department you can build a unit which can uh, stand and uh, which will be recognized and which can present papers and do everything so an additional question to this is you come across an occasional assistant who's whatever you try technically can never reach a certain level i mean you must have seen people who are you know by nature by whatever is is impossible how do you deal with them uh well uh, i let them be there and then after some time i i have eased out people and told them look uh, i think you have used uh, reached your limit but i need something more in a premier institution and uh, so i can um, uh, i cannot have somebody to do a ripples for 16 hours uh, or 18 hours and uh, you know everybody from the anesthetist to the uh, theater boys are laughing because the, they immediately compare dr ramesh does ripple in 2 and 1/2 hours and you are doing it for 18 hours so then that has to be they have to be sort of you know gently moved out and they, most of the time they themselves move out if they don't then we encourage them to go out and we tell them that no this is not really the place for you let, let me let me share a formula 
there, there is a management funda called uh, PSP. Here, the P, first P stands for praise. I said, oh, you are such a good person. You are, when the, the final interview is, you are good, you are hardworking, but your Whipple time is abnormal, right? So then I also, I, I must have recruited hundreds of people and must have terminated around 50 of them over my span of uh, 37 years. So then I'll say, okay, I have never thrown anybody on the road. I always Genius, get sir, your uh, voice is off. Hello? Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. I can, I can hear it. Yeah. Yes, sir, carry on. So the PSP stands for praise, then share your grievance, then finally praise again. You have been good here. But I always get another job to the guy and never thrown somebody on the road. So even when I have terminated him, he is with a job. So when he is with a job, then the heartburn is less. And also the other way also is there. You know, there are some who are, who think that they are the best surgeon in the department and they are very fast and, and they create a lot of complications in the ward. Uh, because they are trying to do things fast. See, I keep telling them, look, speed doesn't come from fast movements. Speed comes from the elimination of unnecessary steps in surgery. This is something you must learn. It is not that I operate uh, fast. No, I eliminate steps which I don't need. I have learned over the years what I don't need and I just eliminate that and I proceed. So, but these people are trying to do things fast and they're trying to do things fast. They cut vessels, they cut... Uh, veins, the fields are messy. Such people will also have to be eased out uh, because uh, they can be a danger. And uh, you will often find that uh, juniors can be very impressed with them. Oh, he's very fast. I ah, know he does like that. So juniors can get a wrong impression. So you must then eliminate such people also. Right, right. When I interview a guy to join my unit, I always tell him that I would love that you stay very long. But there are three things which I make clear to everyone. There are three things which can cut short your stay here to one day. And that is, first is a sexual offense within the unit. Second, a financial embezzlement. Third, any anti-institutional policy. And if you don't do these three things, and even if you know less, just keep asking me, what else he can do about this patient. And then you stay long. So three common things on which people, you know, go wrong. If they are forewarned at the beginning, I have found uh, none of these three have ever happened. Yeah, it's a good thing to warn. Yeah. And always read the biodata carefully. Uh, the way the biodata is written. Uh, some uh, right uh, biodata. Uh, I recently had a neurosurgeon who had applied, and uh, when I saw the biodata, uh, <coughs> I realized that this man must be at least uh, 95 to 100 years old from the number of cases he has done, and he was just 35. So, what it meant was that, you know, it, it, it was humanly impossible that he could have done so many cases. And he was uh, writing, I've done 600 of these, 400 of these, 500 of these, and it is impossible. So, so either if you've not done too many, don't write the numbers. Say you've done this, you've done this, I, I'm confident of doing this, I'm confident of doing this. That's, that's a better and safer way of... Uh, uh, I, I, sir, I call them math specialists. They multiply their cases by 10 and divide their complications by 10. Yeah, so they <laughs> will always, so you have to tell them that. And, uh, you know, and I tell them, look, don't go see this. Uh, one fellow had written, uh, I, I, I believe I'm a fantastic surgeon. I said, this should come from the reference I asked for, not from you. Every man believes he's a fantastic surgeon. I believe I'm a fantastic surgeon. Patta believes he's a fantastic surgeon. Girija believes he's a fantastic All of us believe we're a fantastic surgeon. Surgeons, he goes, are uh, very big. They're, that's why the houses of surgeons have big doors. So, uh, so I tell them that should come from somebody else. So, 
it, I would advise you in best interest to remove such statement. There are ways to write a resume and show your high points without being boastful of it. And uh, there's no need to boast. In uh, many cases, we will know. Because when we take a confidential opinion, we will know what is happening. Sir, you are one of the possibly very few surgeons who stuck on to the same hospital, same compound, same operation theatre for so long. I don't know if there's anybody else who's been like that. But what is the secret? You adjust or they adjust or both of you adjust? No, I think uh, I will put it in a very simple way. Uh, uh, over the last uh, 30 years, I've been offered for many leading hospitals in Delhi, Bombay, Hyderabad, Calcutta to come over and take over as chief of GI surgery or chief of uh, minimal access surgery. But I have uh, invariably turned them down because at Vinaysha Mission Hospital, I get a certain level of respect which I think is uh, more, when I say something, they listen to. And when I say I want an equipment, they listen to me and they get it for me. They always got it for me. And uh, so uh, uh, recently our laparoscopes were getting, because of the heavy turnover on these laparoscopes, we were having uh, the two we bought five years ago, uh, having multiple repairs and they had to go. And that time we were short of, uh, they would give us a standby, but after a gap of two, three months, so we were having a short, uh, problem. So I approached them and I said, I want a new systems. And uh, both my new systems have arrived. I've got a Striker 1688 uh, 4K overlay system. And I've got a uh, Stores Rubina 4K overlay system. Both have been uh, supplied to me uh, in the last week. And uh, no questions asked. Other departments may ask for years, but not get what they want. I asked uh, twice and I got it because uh, they hold me in respect for having stayed and having built my department and make sure that others grow. So I have not stopped the others from growing. So they get their own references, they get their own patients, and I have never stopped that. And that they appreciate that I've grown, I have made the whole department grow. And uh, they respect me. And uh, so I found that to be as uh, uh, rewarding as extra money or moving. Uh, and uh, I have achieved uh, whatever I wanted to achieve sitting in uh, a second year because I could uh, move around. My chief, uh, Setraman, allowed me to go for innumerable conferences. I could speak at meetings. I have given uh, orations uh, at many national bodies, including the Pandalai oration to the Association of Surgeons of India. Um, I have been... Uh, uh, honored with pioneer laparoscopic surgeon of the, uh, of, for the last 30 years, along with seven other luminaries like Udwadiya, Pannivelu, and Chaube. So all this I achieved because I stuck to one place and I was able to build a career. I might have made more money moving. Yes, I might have been very rich, but I think uh, the wealth I've had as a surgeon, what I've accumulated, I think that is... Uh, been irreplaceable and that's one of the reasons why I have stayed. And I think that's something that most youngsters don't understand. They wonder why anybody should stay in a center and they don't understand. But uh, they will understand when they are asked to suddenly leave a place and uh, which has never occurred to me and I've never been asked a single time why uh, I don't go or why I don't leave. I, uh, the administration is perfectly uh, respectful to me and I appreciate that. Ilango, you have a comment to make? Um, well, my difficult question was, can we ever reverse the numbers that we have really skewed up or uh, <laughs> use an unpronounceable word? Can we ever correct that with regard to the PG training? Have we put up too many PGs for too little patients? And yes, training I already told you that. Yes. We yeah. have so how are we going to correct that, sir? That I don't think we can correct that because the, the, the cat has been let out of the bag. And uh, now you see, uh, look at the pressure. We were producing 35,000 MBBS students a year. We went to 70. Next year, we are producing 88,500. In another one, two years, we'll be producing 1.5 lakh uh, uh, medical students a year. Now, you have to provide them with uh, PG training to some. 
So now that means that if for 35,000, we have 10,000 seeds, that means for 1,50,000, we need 50,000 seeds. And uh, we simply don't have the population to have so many diseases. We cannot uh, have so many tumors that everybody can uh, think. And when uh, the government builds uh, big hospitals, uh, free treatment, even though the quality of the treatment, everything may be a little substandard, patients will flock to that. And so your private training will also suffer. So I think that we have already gone into the downfall of uh, uh, training in India in medicine. I, I strongly now advise my relatives who come and ask me about a career in medicine, don't take a career in medicine. In five years from now, there'll be simply too many doctors around. We are going to be producing in Tamil Nadu something like 15,000 students a year. Where is the jobs and PG seats for them? And even if they get, uh, all you're going to end up is unnecessary operations, botched up surgery, and uh, totally wrong treatments given just because they want to earn their daily bread. Not even that they will be rich, they just want to make enough money to earn their daily bread. I think uh, Tamil Nadu has already crossed the WHO thresholds for doctors and you're building more medical colleges. I think it's ridiculous. There is no sense. It's become a political uh, game and the population has gotten taken into it and in 10 years they will realize. And already if you look at it from Punjab, yesterday I read the news that they have 316 NRI quota seats where the fees is $110,000 per year for the whole course. And out of those 316 seats, they only filled four so far. You see? You see what is happening? This is now the trend. And you will soon see seats lying empty. And like dental colleges, in another five years, medical colleges will start closing down uh, because people will no longer be willing to pay the rate because they realize that there is no income huh? and uh, today we pay our uh, MBBS doctors 35,000 rupees a month. In another five years, we can pay them 20,000 and they will still line up. This is what they have done to our medicine. True, sir. True, sir. That's the heartache we all share. And uh, I think uh, uh, more than the surgeons, I look at the plight of the MBBS students and it's yes. really... We, I mean, uh, people like me, Pata, uh, you, we have now crossed that uh, uh, limit where, you know, we have uh, got our earnings, we have finished the children's education, uh, some of us have finished their marriages. So, we are past, we are the no longer the future of Indian surgery, but the past of Indian surgery. So, we are not going to, but the future of Indian surgery is going to be uh, bleak in my opinion, and uh, very, very bleak. Unless these surgeons can start going to, you know, Indonesia, China, um, Saudi, where there are less doctors and help them to serve uh, and get jobs there, they are going to be in terrible mess. On a lighter note, I want to ask another difficult patient. Um, so what do you do with the patient who comes inside your OPD, sits for half an hour, asks all the questions, and does not pay the outpatient consultation fee and says, I just talked with the doctor. Uh, well, uh, we are an institute. So the, he can't come and see me in my OPD till he registers at the counter and pays the registration fee. So this doesn't happen to me. Uh, but I'm sure that this will happen in private practice. And uh, there's really nothing you can do. You can't uh, demand, uh, say, you see, there's a level to be, say, we are not uh, uh, a roadside shopkeeper that we can say, give my money, you have taken this, give my we, can, we will ask for a fee, you don't give, we will write it off in the loss book. In some past janam, we owed him money and we have repaid it. That's all we can think. Vidya, you have something to say? Vidya, are you there? On this note, you know, on this, I, would, I, I, I would like to give my opinion on this. If you have somebody like this, don't be 
upset. Don't think about such an issue. Think what you earn at the end of year. Are you earning better than last year? Thank your stars. You are earning the same. Still be grateful to Lord that in growing competition, you are still at par. And if you are low, think why. Let nobody control your emotional level. Be it a resident, be it your boss, be it an administrator. And other person's idiosity, I cannot control, but I can control my cool head. Let somebody not play with my emotions. By yeah. a gesture. Actually, I like uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar's quote saying that, uh, you know, I'm eternally grateful. Every day I think of, you know, what all I have. I don't bother what others have more than me, but I'm grateful <laughs> for what I have. No, you should. Uh, uh, there's a very famous uh, English uh, uh, poet, uh, Cardinal uh, Wyman, who, who wrote, I cried because I had no shoes. Then I saw a man who had no feet. So, you know, things are in perspective. Uh, so, if you think of those who are less than you, you tend to feel much better. And at least that I at least have this. So, I'm grateful for the roof over my head, clothes on my back, and uh, an income. <laughs> Uh, so, Dr. Ramesh, you mentioned right in the beginning about how the there is the American system which makes sure that the students are trained uh, properly, otherwise they lose their recognition. And uh, you did mention that that's unlikely to happen in India anytime in the near future. So, I had type, typed the same question in the chat box. What if uh, people like uh, you and Dr. Girijada Sharma come up with a plan as to what you think a surgical uh, 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 resident we can realistically do and may not be like in your unit, but you know, looking at the whole perspective, what do you think the first year we should have learned or uh, done by the end? And maybe you know, the all the teachers in learning general surgery or even 50 people start practicing it across uh, the country, uh, uh, that might have a you know, um, snowball effect. And uh, maybe even if there's no rule, people may follow it. And people will choose those institutions, like you said, uh, Meenakshi is the uh, second choice now because they know that they get a good training there. So that also will set off some, uh, you know, competition and things could change. Uh, the, the problem is, madam, that India has gone about it completely the wrong way. You, uh, frankly, there can be no surgical training in three years. That that itself is a mistake that we have started. A surgical training requires a minimum of five or six years, like it is done in uh, US, the rest of the world. Yeah, rest of the world. So, so, so we have to start from there. Only if you can have a five or six year, then you can have a structured course. You cannot have a structured course in three years because you cannot, at the end of three years, say he should do an AP or he should be able to do a shunt. But if at the end of five or six years, yes, we can tell them because they'll be like an MCHG. We can tell them he can do a shunt, he can do a whipple, he can be trained. And once we do that, what we can do is first three years general surgery, then people branch into various uh, specialties or they go straight into neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery without much general surgery, maybe six months so that they can uh, train. So there has to be a fundamental sea change and private practitioners like us cannot change. This has to come from a government chain, from a medical commission uh, point of view, not from our, uh, we don't have the resources to fight the government and change rules. Uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, the overall view of all doctors now is that, you know, don't uh, ask your children not to join medicine or if somebody asks, don't join. So I am just looking at it in a completely non-doctor way. But uh, you know what will happen to us when we are patients if none of the bright and uh, uh, you know uh, good kids can um, uh, join MBBS? Then what happens to the health of the you and me and the rest of the nation? I will hope for a quick MI <laughs> or a quick stroke, and I am gone. I don't have to be treated by these patients. I will end up on an autopsy table or in the. Uh, uh, grave, that's all finished because, uh, but the next generation is okay. Uh, we have seemed to have trained them fairly well. The people in their 40s, people like Alango said to 
people like uh, you know all these arm and uh, this group of liver transplant surgeons heart transplant surgeons youngsters who are who i think are well trained and that that group will sustain us but i am worried about the generation after that where they have remarkably increased pg seats remarkably increased ug seats that is where i am worried uh, not 20 years from now but i am worried 40 50 years from now and that uh, and the problem is that people forget that 40 50 years from now much of uh, the diagnosis will be automatic um, you walk into a clinic as you walk through the doors uh, you will be scanned when you sit on the chair uh, through and put your hand on the handles through percutaneous sensors all your blood measurements will be taken and uh, with uh, uh, high technology blood investigations early cancers will be detected and uh, you really don't need a doctor a machine will tell you you're well you're not well your heart is okay all these things will be done and uh, uh, there are no days are not far off this is going to come artificial intelligence medicine is going to be one of the ones that's going to have artificial intelligence okay thank you dr uh, ramesh adnari and dr girija dad sharma for joining us and having such a um, interactive session uh, ilango you have any closing comments uh, uh, sir uh, the, the important closing comment is that we will leave the discussion open and we would like to have you on more sessions uh, in our program uh, to benefit the youngsters and i am sure uh, senior surgeons as well uh, we are so happy to host you here and we are ever uh, happy to have gds sir moderate the sessions for us thank you both of you for uh, taking up this difficult problem and uh, in advising the juniors as well as people like me uh, in my age group uh, it has been a great learning experience thank you thank you thank you everyone. and thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my opinion if i have inadvertently hurt anybody i apologize for the same thank you very much sir thank you thank you Thank you sir. Thank you everyone. We'll meet again next Tuesday with another episode of Let's Learn Surgery. Till then uh, take care and stay safe. Good night.